All right, so we're in March and we're heading up to Easter. We've got four more weeks before, yeah? We're going to remember the death and resurrection of our King. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about This Is Us. As a church, um, at the retreat, we rolled out a new vision. Not that new, it's an old thing that repeated again, a new commandment I bring, sort of like John used to say. We're rolling out a new vision for the church, and this vision is not from the church to you. It's not something that four people in a room talked about and created. We believe this is God's vision for your life. We believe that throughout the Bible, it's quite clear that God is passionate about people, and He wants to rescue us, He wants to save us, then He wants to clean us up, get us purpose, and then get us serving in His kingdom. And the vision that I'm going to talk about in the next four weeks is I'm going to break down every step of it, because we did it at retreat, but it was quick, and I've been checking, asking people, hey, what's this step? And people are like, making things up and creating new visions. We don't want new visions. So I'm, we're going to talk about it, and I'm going to repeat this and repeat this and repeat this, but this becomes part of our DNA. And if you weren't at the retreat, perfect, because you're going to hear it for the next four weeks. And we're going to look at going in Scripture, then practically unpacking what it looks like to yeah? encounter God, find freedom, discover purpose, and lead in life. So I'm really excited. And like I said before, this is God's vision for your life. It's found in the Scriptures. From Exodus all the way to Revelation, over 14, 15 times, you'll find these four steps, these four pathways of God trying to direct us as, as His people, as His children. Yeah, because we want to live a life of, on purpose for a purpose. Amen. Turn to someone and say, you have a vision. Amen. Amen. And maybe you're thinking, well, I'm a new person. I'm not sure. Well, God has a vision for your life. Maybe you're here and you're like, I've done that. I've been baptized. I'm in my 20th year of Jesus following. Cool. God still has a vision for your life. And these, these steps, what I love about them is that they're not just a progressive path that you just go through. It's actually a cycle that we're constantly growing in our faith on. Yeah, so as I talk about these, don't think, cool, I've done that. Think about, is that something that I'm interested in? Is that something that I'm still looking for in my life right now? Amen? The first one is encounter God. Everybody say encounter God. Yeah, we believe that God wants to encounter you. He wants to save you. He wants to transform your life. He wants to save your soul. He wants you to experience Him. Yeah, this is not just a knowledge or this is something deep. And today, my whole sermon will be about unpacking this encounter God. This is something that we believe is the most important step. Without this one, the rest are a waste of time. This is the most important and it built, everything else is built on top of this. Yeah, this is salvation. This is people experiencing God. And we believe that this is going to happen and be facilitated yeah, in this house. The second one is find freedom. Yeah, everybody say, find freedom. find freedom. This is where people are now getting cared for. This is where you're getting some partial care. This is where the stuff inside of you, the stuff that has maybe been um, damaged or there's been things done to you or things you've done and that you're just still holding on to that. You need to be freed from those things so that you can now live a life of freedom in Christ. And we believe that this is, again, a major key to setting people free. Amen. And we believe this happens through life groups. Yeah, when we get together and we meet, and that's where yeah, finding freedom will actually take place. The third one, everybody say, discover purpose. discover purpose. Yeah, I believe that you're not here for no reason. God has a purpose for who He wants you to be, and then He has something for you to do. And these two things, yeah, you, you and I, I need to know, why am I here? What is His purpose for my life? And the moment I find that, things start aligning. I'm not just wasting time running around in life copying, being a copycat of social media or my friends or my family. Now I know why He's put me on earth. And we believe, we're so passionate that, yeah, God has a purpose for your life. And you'll discover that purpose through a course that we run. So many different ways to discover it, but we're going to be running a course after church called Inner Life Track. And this will be a course where you can go sit for four weeks and here, by the end of it, you'll be leaving with a really good insight and a good look at what is my purpose. So that is how we're going to facilitate that which is so good. The last one, everybody say, lead in life. Lead in life. Amen. Amen. You're not called to just be a doormat. The Bible says you're not, we're not meant to be the tail, we're meant to be the head. And how we lead in life is through serving. Yeah, when I say lead, I don't want us to become CEOs. If you're going to do that, cool. But not to be the boss of somebody, it's actually to be a servant. In the kingdom of God, we go higher by getting low. In the kingdom of God, we're the last to be first. So we believe that we're going to lead in life through everybody serving the body of Christ, everybody picking up a shovel, picking up metaphorical shovel, picking up something that we can do to get our hands dirty and get our sleeves rolled up so that we can 
further unlock God's purpose on our life and to make sure we leave our imprint on the world for God, yeah? An internal impact. So we believe everybody's got something to give and we want to help you and facilitate that for you. So that will happen through joining a team, as we've heard this morning, yeah? We're passionate about getting people serving on a team. So these four things we're really passionate about and we believe that, yeah, through Sunday service, through life groups, through our inner life track and even serving on a team, you'll be able to find God's vision for your life. And this is where you'll find purpose and you'll find joy and contentment all through Christ in actually yeah, following these action steps. Yeah, think of these like a pathway. Yeah? These are our pathway. Is everyone with me so far? Yeah? This is what we really believe. And week by week, I'll be unpacking. So if you feel like, wait, what's, what's this? Don't worry. The explanations will come. And we're going to go to a verse in a second. But for those that are here and those that are even listening, I want to encourage you that sometimes yeah, your vision for life gets a bit muddled, it gets a bit cloudy. And we can have times where we're not sure, where am I going? What's next for me? And that's, that's okay, that's part of life. But what if, yeah, there was always a next step for you to take? What if God always had somewhere for you to go, something for you to do? Because the Word of God's quite clear on that. He doesn't just leave you in a place and you've got to figure it out. He always has somewhere for you to go. Everybody say next step. He always has a next step for you. And that's what I love about God's vision is that there's always somewhere to go. There's always something to move forward to. And I believe that if you know that there's a next step, that means wherever you are in your faith, there's something for you to do. It doesn't matter if you're fresh. It doesn't matter if you're a long-time Christian. There's another step for every single one of us to take. And I find that so encouraging that I don't have to just sit on a on dormant and think, cool, my time is done. No, no, no. I can still encounter God. I can still find more freedom. I can still discover more of my purpose. And I can still serve and lead in life with God. It's so important. And a verse, normally we hear this verse that says, without vision, people perish. Anyone heard of that? Raise your hand if you heard of that. Cool. Without vision, people perish. I want to read it to you in the message version this morning. And it says this, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what He reveals, they are most blessed. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble over themselves. You know, a lot of times you can find yourself in a rut, in a pattern, I talk to a lot of different people and sometimes I can hear it in, we're at this same issue again or we're in the same sort of place and we're on a merry ground a little bit and that's okay. But you know what? That's not God's will for your life, that you go around and around the same kind of problems, maybe with different people, but the same route. Yeah? It's, and it's not even, sometimes we give the devil all the glory. Oh, it's the devil, he's against me, it's demons. I think more of the time it's because we just lack vision for our life. We don't know what's our next step, so we get stuck and we end up blaming somebody else. But really, if we could just get vision, it says here, if we can't see yeah, what God is doing, then we'll stumble all over ourselves. Part of the problem is I'm just stumbling through life because I don't see God's vision for my life. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you feel stuck, hey, just wait a second because God is want to sh- share His vision with you for your life, and now you're going to be able to move from stumbling over to now revealing what that is to you so that you can what? Be most blessed. Who wants to be most blessed this morning? Who wants to be blessed by God? We're not, maybe that's financially and all those sort of things, but I'm talking about blessed, knowing who you are in God, knowing yeah, that you're not a sinner just saved by grace, that you're actually a saint. You're actually a holy person who now has a purpose and a part to play in the kingdom. My goodness, I want to be most blessed, and I know we do too. So this morning, I want to encourage you, this is so important that we actually stop and look and think about God's vision for our life, so we're not stumbling around. Yeah, and I want you to listen to me. God does have a vision for your life. He does. And any voice that says, oh, not me, I'm washed up, I've made too many mistakes, yeah, His mercy is in you every morning. And today is a fresh day where you can hear God's vision for your life and then move, no longer stumbling, but be most blessed. Amen? And what happens if you don't have vision for your life? God's vision. You're going to look for another vision. And I want to tell you, the enemy does have a vision for your life too. His vision for your life says, encounter me. It's all about you, your life, how you can yeah, benefit yourself. Then his vision for your life, this is the enemy's, the counterfeit vision, yeah, is once you encounter me in yourself, then I want to go and yeah, find myself some fame. I want people to know my story. I want to create my own brand, this and that, creating for ourselves our platform. I want to discover my platform. Social media is full of it. I'm an influencer. Look at me. All this. If you're doing that, praise the Lord. Do it God's way. But this is basically the counterfeit vision the enemy offers people. Encounter me. 
find my fame, discover a platform so that I can go and lead in a dollar, go and make some money, make some money off things. This is basically what life will give you if you don't have God's vision for your life. And this, my friend, is empty. This will lead you nowhere. This is not what I want for my life. This is not what God wants for anyone's life here. And I want to tell you that we only can negate this, replace this when we have the truth. Yeah, if we're not following God's vision, we're going to end up leading something like this. So this morning, let's look into the Word of God and unpack His vision for our life through some scripture so that this will not be our story. Are you with me? Amen. Let's go to Ephesians and we're going to read from chapter one. This is a great letter, six chapters, power packed with identity and who God has called you to be. First three chapters are about understanding who you are. The next three chapters are understanding what that looks like in a practical way. But Paul, who's the writer of this, he's a church planner, he's an apostle. And this whole um, part that I'm going to read is his prayer for his people. And I'd like to say that, yeah, this is also, I believe, any leader's prayer for their people. This is my prayer for you this morning. This is what I'm praying for you. So we're going to start from verse 15, just to verse 18. And it says this, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, might give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people. Everybody say amen. Amen. This verse has so much in it, but really quickly, the four steps God's vision for your life can be found in this one passage. Yeah? Yeah? And the first thing he says is that I'm praying because of what I hear that God's doing in your life. I'm praying that you will receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Make note, this is not some other spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. But part of how he manifests is through yeah, revelation and wisdom. He, Paul is praying that you guys will have a revelation. You will have vision. You will see. And he says four things here. The first one and the most important one, he says that, You can have the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. Everybody say, know Him. Yeah? This is encounter God. I'm praying that your eyes will be open so that you can know Him, that you can experience Him. And here at Inner Life, we call it encounter God. I'm praying that you will encounter Him. This is what Paul was praying. This is our prayer. This should be your own prayer for yourself and your family, that everybody will encounter God. He keeps saying, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He's called you. And He keeps going. But part two of our vision is finding freedom. Do you know that your heart has eyes, church? Yeah? That your aorta, ba-boom, ba-boom. It's got a set of eyes on it, apparently. That's what Paul says. I don't know if he did a, I forgot that word is, but when you cut people open. Yeah, I heard everyone say as I heard. I didn't hear anything. But I know one, someone here knows that word. Autopsy, come on, thank you. He must have done an autopsy at some point and then probably resurrected the guy. But he knows that we don't just see with these eyes. And right now you're all looking at me and you're all hearing me. But you know what? Although you're seeing me with these eyes, you're all seeing me totally different. Because the eyes of your heart and the eyes of my heart determine the lens in which we see. And everything that you've experienced up to this point in time has the ability to affect what you're hearing right now. I can say God loves you, but if you've never experienced love before, for example, you haven't found freedom in that area, you hear I love you as different to somebody who has accepted, sorry, experienced love before, and they're kind of receiving what I'm meaning them to receive. How you receive things and how I receive things is through the eyes of our heart. And Paul is saying, I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened, be healed, be freed. Think of it like if you're looking through life through glasses and your glasses are all foggy, If you're looking through that lens, everything's going to be distorted. The eyes of your heart won't receive what God's intending for. So first, I pray that you'll know God. And when you encounter God, that you'll find freedom. The eyes of your heart will be enlightened. Because, yeah, if if my eyes aren't enlightened and I'm going to go through life hurt and I'm going to read every circumstance through that hurt. I'm going to read every circumstance through my pain or whatever I'm going with. So this is something that Paul was passionate about. He's praying for. And as a church, we want everybody to find freedom so that the eyes of our heart will be enlightened. That's, that's part two. And next week, I'll break that down. The third thing, he says that now that the eyes of your heart are open, now you can finally do the next two things. Don't even try to find your purpose and start serving if you don't know God and you have foggy glasses on. You haven't found freedom yet because you'll miss, your, you'll miss your purpose. But he flows and says that you'll know the hope of which he's called to. Everybody say, discover purpose. 
he, this is quite simple. He wants you to know the hope to which you're called to. God yeah, has a calling on your life, and that's where your hope's going to come from. That's where you're going to have yeah, wind beneath your sails, if I can say it like that. That's when you're going to have momentum, when you know God has created me on purpose for a purpose. Are you with me, church? This is what He wants. And the third one, this isn't as clear as it could be, but it says that you will know the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. Yeah, God wants us to know that God has an inheritance. And normally, we read this scripture, and so many times I've done it, so I have to edit it. But we say this is our inheritance. This verse is not our inheritance, church. This says that it's His inheritance. And what is God's inheritance? It says, His people. You are God's inheritance. Did you know that? You are God's glorious inheritance. When He thinks, we think when my, someone dies in my family, cool, then I'll get my money. He's like, I'm waiting for my inheritance. You know what it is? It's you. He's waiting for you to, to end your life here, to then receive his inheritance. And you are his glorious inheritance. And Paul's saying, you need to discover this. Because when I realize, when you realize that we matter to God, that we are his glorious inheritance, then I'm going to start getting passionate about bettering his people, serving one another, leading in life, and joining people to extend the kingdom to get more of an inheritance for God. Do you understand? So this, what he's saying here is, hey, lead in life. I want you to start serving and getting about what I'm about. And God's about people, so that's why we serve, because we serve God by serving people. Amen? This is lead in life. So through this passage, we see God wants us to encounter Him, encounter God. We see He wants us to find freedom, to discover purpose, and lastly, to lead in life. But I want to talk to the importance about knowing God. Yeah? The importance of actually encountering God, because this is so important. And this word here, we just read it, I pray that you will know him. You know what this word know means? This was like people snapping their necks in church in the Ephesus when they heard this. He's like, that you will know him. This isn't just an intellectual awareness of God. This means an experience. This means like a kind of intimacy that a husband and wife would have. He's like, my prayer for you is that you will know him. This word in Greek is ginosko, probably. That's g'day explanation. That's my pronunciation. G'day, mate. Gnosko, this means, yeah, what a husband and wife will do in a closed door. When Adam knew Eve, Genesis 4 verse 1, that is the same word knew is the same word here, that you would know God, that he knew Eve. Did he just think of Eve and then they had Cain? The Bible says Adam knew Eve and they had Cain. That means there was intercourse, there was uh, some experience, there was a very intimate encounter. You know what, there's heaps of words for sex in Hebrew, but they use this word because this isn't just intercourse, this is a deep knowing to fully know and be fully known by. Paul is saying, I pray that you will have this intercourse, this intimacy with God. I'll keep to the intimacy because people are freaking out right now. But, I, but Paul was praying, and my prayer and God's plan for you is that you will encounter Him, not with your head, but with your heart, church. This is a real encounter. This is something real. It's something that you can't just put on a piece of paper or say it. It has to be inside of you. And God is so desperate for this. This is why Jesus came. Not so that we can have a ticket one day to go to heaven, but we can encounter God and know Him in this way. Have this deep sense of intimacy. Amen. You know what? If we don't have this, we're actually going to miss it. Matthew 7 is a scary passage. And this passage scared me when I was younger. And I'm glad it did because it needed to save my life. I'll read it. Verse 21 and 23, it says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? This is a big resume here. Some of us haven't done half this stuff. I haven't even done half this stuff. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Everybody say knew. knew. Yes, yeah, that word. In Hebrew, it's yada. It means this deep intimacy. I never had intimacy with you. Away from me, you evildoers. Oh my goodness. These people casting out devils, they're doing miracles, they're doing all this stuff in the name of Jesus. But they didn't actually have an intimacy with God. He actually never knew them. And for that, he says, depart from me. Thanks for what you've done. People have been benefited. People found Jesus through you. But you and me, there's nothing here. There's no intimacy. And they, they said, he considers them evildoers. That's scary. When I grew up in the church, I knew everything about God. I memorized one point in time, 80 scriptures off the top of my head. Praise the Lord for iKids in the program that trained me. But you know what? By the time I was 19, I was so far from God. I could, if you ask me, do you know God? Yeah, I know God. But was I having intimacy with Him? No. 
And I'm glad that he didn't return because if he returned in the state I was in, I don't know if I would have been going to heaven. I think I would have been one of these guys. I remembered 80 verses. I went to church. I was a PK, a pastor's kid. I never knew you, Neil, because me and you never had intimacy. And it wasn't until I was 19 years old and I heard some kids standing at this pulpit talking about their encounter with God at a youth camp that it drove me into my room and said, God, I need to encounter you afresh. I'm so far from this. This has turned into a head thing rather than a heart thing. And God's become someone I meet on a Sunday rather than somebody I'm living with every day. And church, I don't know if you're new or you're a believer, but we all need to know God and encounter God regularly, every single day. It's not enough to just have an idea. You can't live off the fumes of your baptism 20 years ago. You need to encounter God today, church. You need to have a fresh experience with Him because yeah, I don't want any of you to be knocking on, and he's like, well, you encountered me, but then you stopped encountering me. You knew of me, then you stopped knowing me. It's a relationship. You and God need to have time together, or else you're going to fall out of connection. Not that he rejects you, but we move away from him. Yeah, We move away from him. So we need to know him. And how do we know him? Real simple. You've got to just surrender. How can I continually know God? One word for you, surrender, church. Whether you're here for the first time, yeah, I want to encourage you, surrender your life to Jesus. Because he fully surrendered his life for you. And the reason we don't encounter God is because we're half half. I'm talking to even believers. How I got to where I was was because I was half half. Yeah, this verse in Jeremiah, I'll finish with this. Jeremiah 29, verse 13 to 14, it says, If you look for me wholeheartedly, everybody say wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I've sent you and bring you home again to your own land. Yeah, this verse says, if you wholeheartedly seek me, you'll find me. That means if you half-heartedly seek me, you won't find me. If you give me half, you'll never find me. If you give me half your life, I'll only be able to transform the half you give me. If you want me to fully change you, then fully give your life to me. Following Jesus and encountering God only happens when we fully surrender our lives to Him. And I'd be selling you short if I told you, come and just say a prayer. Come and give your life to Jesus. Yeah, this is what happens. Half, half Christianity, you come, you join a group, but you feel like it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because it's not meant to be half, half. And then when it doesn't work, you think, well, it didn't work and God's not that good. Hey, God is good and it works, but you just got to continually, yeah, wholeheartedly pursue Him. And if you do, God's not a liar. You will find Him. You will find what you're looking for. You'll find hope. You'll find forgiveness for your sins. You'll find a a purpose for your life and you'll find everything that you're needing. But it only comes when we seek Him wholeheartedly. So this morning, I don't know who I'm talking to, but we are passionate about you encountering God. Not just getting into heaven, but encountering God to be in this intimate, personal relationship with Him. The answer is surrender.